Let's get into the word this morning. We are in 1 John. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles up to 1 John chapter 2. Now, the second chapter of 1 John, uh, we're going to begin today in verse 1 there. Now, again, remember that John, uh, John is the last apostle alive at the time of this writing. He's somewhere likely in his mid-80s. He has been walking with the Lord now for uh, about walking with Jesus for 70 years. I mean, seven decades. He began following Jesus as a teenager. Think about that. And so this brother has logged a lot of mileage with the Lord. This is one high mileage apostle here. All right. Uh, Imagine the wisdom that you would have not just in walking with the Lord for 70 years, but, but walking for 70 years at the level of commitment that John had and the, and the proximity to Jesus that John had. Now, now John, he, he's walked with Jesus. He's talked with Jesus. He's eaten with Jesus. He, he heard him teach. He saw him heal. He was there at the transfiguration. This guy saw Moses and Elijah alongside a glorified Christ. John has watched him die. He was the only apostle there at the foot of the cross, you remember. He was the only one that didn't bolt. The others went nuts. Uh, He met Jesus arisen. Maybe two of you got that. Uh, He watched Jesus ascend. Look, you would be very hard-pressed to find a man as close to Jesus as John was. Now, John, he is called three times in John's gospel. He is called the beloved disciple. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't love the other disciples, but it does, in some sense, I think, communicate to you and I that, that John enjoyed a very unique closeness, a very unique proximity to Christ. After all, he was the one to whom Jesus entrusted care for his mother, right? Now, why am I telling you all these things? Because I want you to grab the immense privilege it is to have John inspired by the Spirit of God in the twilight of his life with his immense experience and unique proximity to Christ. I want you to appreciate that this is the man that is going to be our instructor for the never, uh, next several weeks. It, it, this is one awesome opportunity that we have before us in First John. Very unique. Now, I don't know how many of you have begun to figure this out. Probably many of you. But the older you get, the simpler uh, things tend to become, right? When you're younger, you think you know everything. And so, therefore, you tend to complicate everything. And then as you begin to get a little mileage under the hood, well, you begin to realize that the things that you thought were so important, well, well, they're, they're not so important at all, really, are they? And so here is John writing not only from a great wealth of experience, but the man is 85 years old. He, he has been around the dance floor more than a few times, right? He is in the twilight of his life. And so John writes with just great clarity and great simplicity for you and I, his readers, about that which is absolutely essential. There is no fluff here at all. Now, again, the church uh, at the end of the first century uh, was taken, uh, they were taking quite a hit from the second major wave of false teaching that had uh, made its way to the shores of the church. We talked quite a bit about that last week. But understand that at the time of this writing, there is a great deal of confusion in the church concerning just what it is that God expects of his children, what it looks like to be a Christian. And today, I believe we have the very same problem. There is a great deal of confusion in the church as to just what it is that biblical Christianity is. You go out on the street and you ask 10 people what Christianity is, you are probably going to get 10 very different answers. And so John here, one of the wonderful things about uh, this epistle of 1 John is John writes, again, with great clarity, great simplicity, and and like James, with great force as well. John is very direct. And so John gives us a very direct kind of no-nonsense instruction concerning just what Christianity is to be. And, And man, we need that in our day. We need that in this day of confusion. Now, as far as his purposes for writing this letter, you remember John told us last week in chapter 1, he said that he was writing 1 John so that our joy would be made complete, that our joy would be made full. Now, the gospel of John itself 
the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John's gospel, he wrote that people might believe. The intent of his gospel was to establish the deity of Jesus, that Jesus was, in fact, God manifested in the flesh, that people might believe, that they might come to a saving faith. And, and this is why whenever an unbeliever would approach me and uh, with some interest in the Bible, John, the gospel of John is a very good place for them to start, a very good um, place to direct them. Now, here in 1 John, however, John is not writing that you may believe. He is writing to those who already believe. He is writing directly to the church, a church that is confused, no doubt, but, but the church nonetheless. And reason number one that John gives for writing these uh, to these believers, to you and I, is that as Christians, our joy would be made full. Again, that our joy would be made complete. Now, John told us last week that you and I, to that end, John told us last week that you and I have been created for fellowship with God. I mean, that's why we've been created, to do life and share life with our God. And until we get that, until we experience fellowship with God, our, our joy is not going to be made complete. John began to tell us, Here's how fellowship with God works, guys. This is how it works. This is the path to deep joy. Number one, you recognize that God is utterly perfect and holy and just and good in all things. There is no shadow of turning within him. You don't get cute with God, all right? He's not the big guy in the sky. You don't make him less than what he is. He is holy. Number two, You seek to walk in his light for your own good, for your own flourishing. God is not after a kind of begrudging submission from you and I. Okay, that's not who he is. He is after you, absolutely flourishing as a a child of God, as a son or daughter of the Lord. And, And running the Lord's program for your life, that's how you get there. Now, the third thing that he then told us in John 1, at first John 1, is that, look, man, you're going to blow it from time to time. You just are. But when you do, if you're just honest with God, if you're just honest and you just bring forth confession, we said that biblical confession is you simply being in agreement with what God says about you in his word. James tells us, right? I think it's 3, 2, that we all stumble many times, okay? But, but, but if we're, when we do, if we just bring that to the Lord, be honest with who we are, where we're at, the Lord is then going to what? Be faithful to forgive and cleanse and, and forget, right? And man, you just get up and keep on moving down the road. You offer that broken moment to the Lord and you move on. Well, that sure sounds great, Mr. Pastor Guy, man, sir. But you don't look, you, dealing with this sin thing, it, this is a little more complicated on the ground than that for me, all right? And, and I am telling you, and John is going to tell you, look, it, it, it's not more complicated than that. Jesus Christ the righteous has seen to that, and this is now where John takes us at the top of chapter 2. Reason number one, John wrote that our joy might be made full. Reason number two, the second reason John writes this letter is what we have right here in verse 1 of chapter 2. So let's get after it this morning and go to work right there. Notice what he says in verse 1. My little children... There's that warm, fatherly affection that we see from John. My little children, I am writing, the, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. There's purpose number two right there. And if anyone sins, we have, underline this word, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself, verse 2, is the, underline this as well, propitiation for our sins... And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now, John here, understand, he's not talking down to his first century readers by by calling them little children. Again, this is an expression of kind of warm, fatherly affection here. He deeply cares for these people. And so he tells them in verse 1, look, I am writing this letter. Purpose number 2 here is so that you may 
not sin. John does not want these people that he cares for to sin. And and he does not want them to sin at all. He says, so that you may not sin. Now, this might seem like kind of an odd thing for John to say, given where he left his readers at the end of chapter 1, right? He just told us before this, you remember, if you say that you have no sin, you are deceived. He said that every one of us, this side of the resurrection, we are always going to be pushing back against our sin nature. We're all going to struggle as long, with sin as long as we are in these bodies of flesh. And, and yet here he is now saying, so, so you're going to struggle, and if you don't say you do, you're, you're, you're deceived. And, and now here he is saying, but I don't want you to sin at all. Now, we have to be so very careful here because there are all kinds of traps, all all kinds of errors, all all kinds of opportunities to swerve into some really bad theology here. It's very, very important to your Christian experience that that you have a proper understanding of a a proper theology of sin and grace and and how all this works. And and that's why I love 1 John, such wonderful clarity here. Now, what I'm going to try to do here is, is sort of work backwards um, from what John says at the end of verse 1 and verse 2 and then kind of back into his assertion at the front end of, of the verse that I don't want you to sin. Now, notice that when we do sin, John says that we have an advocate with the Father, and that advocate he calls Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, this word for advocate here, it means defense attorney, This is a legal term here. This is Greek language straight out of their court system. John is saying there was someone, there is someone standing beside you and I before the court of heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible tells us elsewhere that the prosecutor, so so he's the defense attorney. The the Bible tells us elsewhere that the prosecutor is the devil himself, right? Revelation 12.10. He is the accuser of the brethren. That's you and I. And isn't it interesting, by the way, um, how Satan works? It's interesting. He, he will tempt you and lure you and entice you into sin and, and, and set traps and bait you. And then the minute you take the bait, he turns right around and becomes your accuser. Okay? That's his strategy. Bait and switch, bait and switch, bait and switch, rinse and repeat. That's what he does. Now, again, John tells us we have the advocate, the defensive attorney, Jesus Christ the righteous, who stands beside you before the throne of God. And I I am here to tell you, he is undefeated. He has not lost a case in well over 2,000 years. In fact, Isaiah calls him the wonderful counselor. Never thought you'd know a wonderful attorney, did you? Well, you do. And he is Jesus Christ the righteous, as John calls him here. Now, what makes him so wonderful is not that you and I are not guilty, because we are, right? Romans 3. Jesus isn't standing before the Father saying we're not guilty, but what he is saying is, I've already paid the fine. I've already done the time, if you will, for whatever it is that you have been, and notice, will be yet accused of. Again, you remember in closing last week, Jesus, uh, right before he gives up the ghost on the cross, he, he said, to tell us die, right? He said, it is finished. He didn't say, well, it's almost finished. He didn't say, you know, I've got most of the bill covered. No, no, he said, to tell us die, paid in full. That word for propitiation in verse 2, fancy term, it means to fully satisfy. It means to fully appease, in this case, the just wrath of God against the cumulative sins of humanity. That's the whole world part there at the end of verse 2. John is saying Jesus himself is the propitiation. He is the satisfaction. His payment for our sins on that cross, John is saying, fully appeased, fully satisfied the just wrath of God against sinful man. And, of course, you remember the resurrection was proof of that. We saw that in Luke. Jesus is our advocate, our defense attorney uh, before the courts of heaven. He appears appears alongside uh, uh, us on our behalf, and he says, oh, they're guilty. 
but I have fully satisfied their debt for sin. And the father looks at that and says, yes, you have, son. They are free to go. Praise God for that. Now, again, what is it now that we are free, having been saved from the penalty of sin, what is it that we are free now to go and do? Well, again, God desires to now lead you. And by the way, this is available to every one of us, though we don't take it. God now desires to lead you into the fullness of joy. And, and, and that we learned that is found, the source of joy is to be found in glad-hearted fellowship with God. Now again, the penalty for our sin has been forgiven. But, but that does not mean, so the penalty for our sin has been forgiven, but that does, not want, that, that, that does not mean that God wants you to go and continue to sin and ask for forgiveness only to turn around and go and sin some more. Why? Here's where I want you to dial in. Let, let, listen up. Because sin, though its penalty is forgiven, still carries consequences, doesn't it? Though its penalty is forgiven, the consequences of sin are ever before us. Sin, though forgiven, breaks fellowship. It breaks fellowship. I, I, I sin against you, you sin against me. Well, now we got a problem, don't we? Because our fellowship has been disrupted for a period of time. Same deal with God, guys. Sin disrupts fellowship. That's why John said in chapter 1, you cannot walk habitually in sin and claim to have fellowship with God. It is the lack, I think, of properly understanding how these things work that is the reason for so much joylessness in Christianity. Look, you show me a joyless Christian. Now, now they may be saved, all right? But you, you show me a joyless Christian. I am showing you a person that's not in right fellowship with God in large part because they don't have a right understanding, a, a proper theology of sin and grace. That's why they're without joy. Now, John has said we will miss the mark, but his point here is he doesn't want us to. He said we will miss the mark, but he doesn't want us to. That is not the target that we are to be shooting at because it breaks fellowship, and it has consequences. Maybe this will help, maybe it won't. It's like this. You, you're a dad, all right? You're a dad. You have a young son going off to war. You're dropping him off at the airport there. You're saying your goodbyes. You pull up to the curbside, you're, and you're hugging him, and it's, oh, man, I love you, man. I, I'm going to miss you. Please be careful out there. And his response is, well, I sure, I don't, I, I sure hope I don't get shot very often. You're going to say, excuse me? No, son. That's not the target. My desire as your father is that you don't get shot at all. But dad, you're living in the Stone Age, man. You don't understand the medical advances here, man. I can be shot and within hours be flown by a helicopter to a state-of-the-art facility with the best doctors. I mean, just an awesome, a top-notch rehabilitation. It's not like it was in your day. You're going to say, no. Son, you don't understand. My desire as your father is that you do not get shot at all. It is the very same thing with our Heavenly Father and sin. Now, yes, I can ask Jesus forgiveness, and I will have it. That sin will not keep me out of heaven's doors, right? I mean, he will wash me and cleanse me from my sin. But that hour of disobedience might very well usher in years of heartache and rehabilitation. What is this sin going to do to my marriage? How is this sin going to impact my children? Or that friend or, or that coworker who is just beginning to warm up with Christ? What shots am I going to sustain? 
What spiritual limbs might I lose? And friends, we haven't even mentioned the issue of rewards in heaven, right? Which we've done over and over and over again. It is obedience, friends, and we'll get to this in a minute. It is obedience that postures favorably the landscape of your eternal experience. Listen, your sin, though forgiven, has some real consequences, both presently and in the world to come. And so John is saying, look, the target that we are shooting at, the target that we are shooting at is not, well, I hope I don't sin very often, The target is, the bar is, man, I don't want to sin at all. The target is, man, I want to be done with this garbage. I I, I want to be done with the way I react to people. I I want to be done with this hard heart and and this lack of forgiveness. I I want to be done with this narcissism. Man, nothing good is coming out of it. There is more collateral damage being done here than I have been giving attention to. I want to be done with this. Man, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And for the mature Christian, there's even a, an added flavor to that. It's, it's man, I, 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 am, I am so tired of just breaking the sweet fellowship that I had going on with my God. Man, I I love the peace and joy and and hope and and communion with my God. I do not want to disrupt that anymore, man. I, I just don't. I can't do this anymore. So the target, the target that John is saying you and I ought to be shooting at this week is to just not sin. Now, Chances are it's not going to work. You know, chances are you're going to blow it. But when you do, well, you have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous, do you not? You see how this works? This is the proper theology of sin. God is holy. God is perfect. God is just. God has wrapped himself in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. He has come and he has lived the perfect sinless life. And then he gave that life in exchange for sinful man. And the just wrath of God against sin was appeased, propitiated. Now, though your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven, God has not saved you that you might remain unchanged in sin. He has saved you that you might flourish as a human being in right fellowship with him and other people. And though we will miss the mark, though we are forgiven when we do sin, it breaks fellowship and it has consequences. Your heavenly Father's desire is that you do not get shot at all. All right? All right, sin is serious stuff. More clarity from John. Love this guy, verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him. Underline that word know. You're going to see it over and over. By this, so how do we know that we know him? Well, by this we know that we have come to know him. Notice, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. This is what you call clarity. And the truth is not in him. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word. Now notice John is using these terms interchangeably here, right? Obeying his commandments, keeping his words. Same thing. In other words, keeping God's word is obeying his commandments. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God, notice, has been truly perfected, completed, matured. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides, verse 6, I love that word. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. All right. So John has spent the better part of chapter 1 and the first two verses of chapter 2 giving us really the proper theology the, uh, set against the holiness of God, right? The proper theology, the proper understanding of sin, and then the answer to our sin problem, Jesus Christ the righteous, our advocate. And, and having done that now, John now desires to come and set forth the proper theology of obedience, 
And he does, again, he does so with great efficiency and clarity. Now, if some of you have more of a philosophical bent to you, uh, you could say that John has dealt with the re- renunciation of the negative condition, namely sin, and now he's moving to the positive condition, namely obedience. And so let's see what we can do to take our lead from John here and, and bring forth some, some real clarity on this issue of obedience. Now, um, first of all, we have to be very careful once again with the order. Okay, here's a Bible study hack I've given you before. Always pay attention to the order in which the text presents itself. Now, John doesn't say we keep the commandments and now we know that we know God. No, no. He says just the inverse. We know God and the result of knowing God is that we now desire to keep his commandments. You got that difference? John is not saying we keep the commandments And now we know that we know God. No, it's just the opposite. The result of knowing God is now a desire to keep the commandments. And so the first thing to grab here, if I can um, clean this up just a little bit, is that, that John is saying we obey God not in order to know him, but because we know him, we desire to obey him. Let's get yet a bit further clarity on this as well. Now, now this word for know that I had you underline there, that, that, that we have come to know him, this is the, I love this word, this is the Greek word gnosko, and it means to know by intimate experience. This is not head knowledge. Okay? The idea here with gnosko is an intimate personal knowledge acquired by ongoing fellowship. That's what gnosko means. It is what is produced in relationship. So let's build on what John is communicating here. John is saying we do not obey God in order to have a personal relationship with him, but because we are in intimate personal relationship with him, we now desire to obey him. Okay? That's how you know that you know him. And we'll get to that. Now, This is the great dividing line between Protestant theology and the theology of the Catholic Church. And, of course, you could probably throw the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons in there, really any so-called branch of Christianity uh, that claims we have to somehow earn our standing um, with God. The, The idea that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough, but we have to somehow add to that by our obedience. We call this error works-based salvation. Oh, oh, it's Jesus, all right, but it's Jesus plus what we do that earns our standing before God. And you would be shocked at how many people in this room still buy into that. Now, Protestants, we come along and we say, well, wait a minute, let's go to the Word of God. That's not what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2. He said this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one would boast. How would God God get glory that way? In other words, Paul is saying, you yourself had nothing to do with salvation, and that by divine design, because otherwise we couldn't fit that big old head of yours through the doorway, and even if we could, the rest of us could probably hardly stand being in the same room with you. Now, John here is saying the very same thing. We don't obey the word of God in order to have a relationship with him, but because we have a relationship with him. We bring forth obedience. Look, I I am telling you, some of the most miserable people on the planet are religious people. And by religious, I mean people that think they have to somehow earn a standing before God. Because that man, it is just a restless, just a miserable place to be. And and here's why. Because you're always insecure towards yourself. You're, You're insecure concerning yourself because you never know if you've done enough. So, so you're insecure towards yourself, and then you're judgmental towards others because you don't think they have either. Tim Keller sums this up nicely for us. He says, religion says, I obey, therefore I am accepted by God. The gospel says, I am accepted by God, therefore I obey. You tracking? 
Now, the other very important practice, and by the way, but before I move into that, get off the page here for a minute, if any of you struggle with this idea that you somehow earn your salvation or that, that you have to add what Jesus did on the cross, man, please let me know that by a prayer card because I want to meet with you. I want to pray with you. I want you to have clarity that what he d- did on that cross was, it, it is enough for your salvation. Christianity isn't do, 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 do. That's a bunch of doo-doo. <laughs> Christianity is done done. And I want you to know that. I want you anchored in that. I want you to rest in that. Now, the other very important, very practical thing that John is telling us here is he is giving us a measuring stick, right? He's, he's giving us a micrometer, a kind of barometer. He is telling you, in fact, he is telling you how to, in fact, know whether or not you have this intimate personal relationship with God. And if people are always wanting to, man, man, people want to know, where am I at with God? Well, here John tells us with great clarity, if you have a reasonably mature relationship with God, you are going to be keeping his word. It's just that simple. He says with great clarity in verse 3, and and by the way, again in verse 5, he repeats it, but look at verse 3. It's how we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, now don't misunderstand. John is not trying to, this is not a drive by guilting. This is not John heaping any condemnation upon anybody. John is writing to believers here. There is no condemnation in Christ, right? Romans 8, 1. What John is saying to you and I is, look, This is something you don't want to get wrong. You forget to lock your truck. Your tools get ripped off. Well, not good, but you're only out a couple of hundred bucks. You forget your wife's birthday. Definitely not good, but you're only going to sleep on the the couch for a week, and I, I don't know, maybe you're denied some other ancillary benefits there. I'm not sure, but... But if you get this wrong, if you do not know where you are at in your relationship with God, that, friends, has enormous impact on both your present and eternal condition. And John's saying, man, here's how you know. Here's how you know that you know God. How are you doing with bringing forth obedience? The degree to which you are bringing, so this is our measuring stick. The degree to which you are bringing forth obedience to the word of God in your day-to-day decisions in life, John is saying that bears a very direct relationship to the relationship and fellowship that you're experiencing with God right here and right now today. And so each of us has a measuring stick now uh, that we can take to the Lord in in the quietness of our hearts. Uh, How am I doing with God? Simple. How am I doing with others? Right? Am I preferring other people? Am I elevating others' needs above my own? own? Am I loving well? Am I loving without expecting something in return? Am I loving sacrificially? Am I forgiving? Am I extending to others the same mercy that's been extended to me? Just how is it that I am doing and bringing forth simple obedience to the Word of God on the ground in my life? Because that is a direct reflection, John is saying, of where I am at in my fellowship and my relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, again, look, let's keep our theology of obedience crystal clear here. You are not saved by your obedience. But it is obedience that ushers in the blessing of God into your life today and favorably postures the quality of your eternal experience. Matthew 16, 1 Corinthians 3, Revelation 22, many others. Relax there in your study guide. If you say that you have intimate, personal, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, then you are saying by definition, are you not that you trust him? That you trust in his direction 
for your life, his program for your life. You trust that that direction and that program, this word is going to lead you to flourish as a human being. I mean, it's what John's saying in verse 5. If he is not only Savior, but your Lord as well, as you are simply allowing the Word of God to govern your heart and direct your steps, John says there in verse 5 that you are going to be perfected. You are going to be maturing in love. That's what God is after. That's what God is after. God does not want us to, be, to, to end up in a place where, where we are nothing more than, than self-righteous religious people, but rather he wants us to end up in that place where we are lovers of God and because of that, lovers of one another. And the promises, the beautiful promises, as long as there is that desire on, on our part to be what God wants us to be, that love is constantly going to be perfected and matured. Notice what this looks like on the ground, verse 7. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. The idea is you've already heard this. And then verse 8, John, well, on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which, notice, is true in him. So that must mean same commandment, but now it's true in Christ. There's something different here. Otherwise, why would he say this, right? So on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. You stay on that path. You're bringing forth obedience. You're going to be perfected and matured. There's that process, that, this progression that, that is spoken of there um, in the text. The darkness will be passing away, right? Because the true light is already shining. Now, uh, this can come off a bit confusing, can it not? Because it seems at first read that that John sounds maybe a little bit schizophrenic. Verse 7, I am not writing a new commandment, but an old one. Verse 8, but you know what? On the other hand, come to think of it, I am writing a new commandment here, I suppose. Now, John, which is it? You know, what, what is it that you're after here? Let's unpack that. Now, the old commandment that John is talking about in verse 7, that he characterizes there as from the beginning, which you have heard, he's taking them all the way back to the two pillars of the Old Testament Mosaic law. Love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. That's Deuteronomy 6.4. And then love your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus 19.18. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it should, because Jesus summed up the entire body of the Old Testament Testament law with those two commands. Love God, love your neighbor. All three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in order to understand why John is calling this new in verse 8, it's because Christ Jesus redefined it. And so in this, I think we have a great picture of the difference between religion and relationship. First of all, understand that in the Old Testament, They were loving their neighbor because it was the law. Because it was the law. Oh, love your neighbor as yourself? All right. Well, if I want to keep the law, I'm going to have to treat my neighbors. I would like them to treat me. And and I need to do that, number one, so I can earn a standing before God. And number two, so I don't have to go down to the temple with another sacrifice or pay some kind of fine or whatever. Understand, Bible students, that this whole love your neighbor deal in the Old Testament Hebrew culture, this was not agape love. Okay, This 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 wasn't a sacrificial love. To these guys, it was all about clearing the bar, keeping the law. It was a very very legalistic kind of love. It's why that guy said to Jesus in Luke's gospel, oh, love my neighbor? All right, well, well, who's my neighbor? You know, let's just define that. Let's narrow this down a little bit. I I need to know what I'm responsible for. It, It was all about the law. Now, here comes Christ in the new covenant, and he puts a very different spin on this, and this is now the new commandment that John is referring to in verse 8. Jesus says this in John 13. Notice, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, and here's what's different, even as I have loved you. Well, that ratchets the deal up quite a bit, doesn't it? 
A new commandment, this is what John's talking about, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now notice here, how, how does Jesus define loving one another? Well, he says, even as I have loved you. So, so notice now, it's not loving another as you would yourself now, but now it's loving one another as Jesus loves us. So I'm not to love you as I would love myself. That's the old spin. The new commandment is you are to love as Jesus loved us. Well, well now that takes it to a whole other level, doesn't it? I mean, that is ratcheting up the deal quite a bit. So now I am to love sacrificially. Now I am to love not expecting anything in return. Now I am to love simply for the sake of loving another individual not because I'm trying to, to, not because I'm trying not to break some religious law that's going to cause my standing before God to, to be impinged or who, who knows what. What is new here, friends, listen, what's new is the motivation to love. We're not loving to clear some religious hurdle. And, and we're not even compelled by some sense of moral duty. Well, you know, loving this person is the right thing to do, so I guess I should just do it. No, no. We are to love as Christ loved us. The love of Christ, and here's what I want to take this to. Here, here's what I want you to connect. The love of Christ flowed out of, just very naturally flowed forth from his perfect harmony with, his perfect fellowship with the Father. Right? He said, all that I see the Father doing, that is what I do. I and the Father are one. And so it is to now be with us. That, and, and this is John's point in the larger context of this epistle. Don't, don't miss this. If you and I are enjoying, if we are experiencing fellowship with our God, our love for others, man, we're not striving. We're not sweating. We're not, it, it, it is just very naturally produced. If I am in right fellowship vertically, that horizontal fellowship, it is a natural byproduct of being in right fellowship with God. Here's the very practical application. Here, here's John's own commentary on what he's trying to say here. Let's take it home. Finally this morning, verse 9. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now or still in darkness in some of your translations. Verse 11, uh, but I'm sorry, verse 10. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, walks in it, lives in it, is a part of it in unity with it, right? The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for, underline this word, stumbling, Underline that word stumbling. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does, listen to this indictment, and does not know where he is going. You don't know where you're going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, isn't it interesting? I, I am fascinated by verse 10 here. This Greek word that, that John uses for stumbling here, this is the Greek, uh, the Greek word scandalon, and it literally means the bait stick in a box trap. The closest maybe that we could come to this is, you know, those old fashioned, those old school mouse traps where you had the little lever you would put the cheese or the peanut butter. The scandalon was the part of the trap that would hold the bait. John is saying that if a believer will walk in love, he is not going to be taking the bait that the enemy is setting out. I think it's just a wonderful image that John is throwing out here. If you are walking love, if you are walking in love, that is, that, that is going to cause you to not be so vulnerable to the multiple traps the enemy desires to lay all around you. 
Now, the converse, John is saying, is also true, right? This word for hates in verse 9 and verse 11, this word means to detest. It has the idea of belittling. It it means to think very little of. Social media, a wonderful breeding ground for the kind of hate that John's talking about here. If you think that you are somehow superior, if you are an arrogant, condescending individual, if if you have not compassion on anybody that thinks just a little bit differently than you do, John is saying here that you are walking in the darkness. John is saying that you are blind. John is saying you have taken the bait and the bait has blinded you. And now he says, you do not know where you are going. That is not good. Look, and and, and this is where we'll land the plane for today. It goes back to the three purposes we said that John had written this letter by way of introduction last week. John has written that our joy might be made full, that we would not sin. We've seen those two already. And he will tell us in chapter 5 that we might know that we have eternal life. So the understatement of the year here, John thinks it's pretty important that you know where you're at with God. And he has written this letter to help us out very practically with that. Because understand, wherever wherever you fall short, look, we all do. Wherever you fall short, understand, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ the righteous that we can turn to. And and, and again, chapter 1, man, man, if if we're just honest with God, if, if we're just honest with him about who we are and where we're at, if we'll bring forth confession, he will be faithful to forgive and forget and cleanse all of those things that the Spirit of God, by his conviction, is beginning to bubble up in our hearts as we read this. Okay? Look, look, friends, this might be the, the wisest thing that, that came from this little platform today. This is the Christian life. It is It is about the renunciation of sin. The, the Christian life is an ongoing cycle of confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. Rinse and repeat. If you find yourself moving away from that cycle, your Christian maturity, which, by the way, Um, John is going to take up the next time we get together. If you find yourself moving away from or off of that cycle of confession and repentance, then your Christian maturity is going to come to a screeching halt. You are going to be stopped dead in your tracks. You will absolutely stagnate your Christian growth. You have taken the bait. Now, John is not trying to say anybody in this room has lost their salvation. That's not where he's going. His hope, again, in writing this letter is that you would be more secure in that than when you began this letter. What John is seeking to accomplish here is to lay a crystal clear road before us that we might know where we're at with God, that we might keep the, 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 the train of Christian growth and maturity just moving on down the tracks, right? And, and again, listen to me. This, this, this isn't, really listen, this isn't condemnation. This is invitation. Friends, you must not see conviction as condemnation. because That's nothing more that, than um, bait that will blind you. Don't, don't see it that way. You must see conviction not as condemnation, but rather a good and right and beautiful and sweet invitation. Because he wants more for you and he wants you to flourish. John has given you and I a set of measuring sticks, a set of of measuring devices that we might move the train of our Christian growth and maturity on down the tracks, man. That's why he's writing, so that your joy would be made full. Now, we've got a fairly specific context here in the first part of 1 John 2. Here's the practical takeaway I hope for you and I this week. Here's the hurdle in 1 John 2, the context of our passage. Uh, Because this is how we think. 
We think, well, if I love my brother, well, then I'll be walking in the light. I mean, that's it right there. If I can just muster up enough love for my brother, well, then I'll be walking in the light. No, no. That's a religious hurdle. Do we understand that? That is religious thinking. It's backwards. I I don't work. I don't sweat. I don't strive. I, I, I don't try to love my brother in order to walk in the light. It is walking in the light that is going to produce a love for my brother. What God is after is is this. This is what John is after. If I am in fellowship with God, if I am first getting after my vertical relationship with God, if I am prayerfully pursuing him in his word, if I am growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, learning to delight in him, growing in my marvel and awe of this inexhaustible treasure that I have in Christ, as I am doing that, as I'm keeping myself on that path, I am going to come to an ever-increasing understanding of his immense grace towards me. I'm going to come to an ever-increasing understanding of his immense mercy towards me. And that then, listen, is going to cause me to be infinitely more gentle with my brother, isn't it? It's going to cause me to be infinitely more merciful with my brother, infinitely more forgiving, infinitely more loving. It's not do. It's not doing. It's abiding. It's not working. It's walking. It's not struggling and striving and sweating. It's simply seeing. Seeing one another, one another through the lens and the heart and mind of God is what causes you and I to love well. So let us this week just seek to, again, I beg you, rest in the finished work of Christ. Let us seek to rest in the finished work of Christ and, and just pursue uh, the, the great joy and delight that is to be had in right fellowship with him. And, and friends, can we... Can we um, Every week or two, I, I think I say this to you. Can, can, we, can we be done with settling? Let us not settle. Can, can we be, d- talk about being done with something. Can we be done with the, medi- the mediocre Christian experience that we've, we've been somehow willing to settle for? Can, can, can we just be done with that? Because God has more for each and every man and woman, boy or girl, child in this room. God has more for you. He's not after begrudging submission. He's after you, flourishing to his glory. God has more for you. This isn't religion. This is about your experiencing that abundant life and fellowship with God, that he gets glory, others see it. So so can we set the target a little bit higher? Remember, it is your heavenly Father's desire that you do not get shot at all this week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I I pray. God, thank you for your son. Thank you for your word. I I pray that you would forgive us of the weakness of our appetites for you. Lord, I pray you would forgive us that the tail, uh, for for the tail wagging the dog in our Christian experience. Lord, Lord, we've become more consumed in the church with chasing the proper Christian behavior than we have with pursuing you yourself as our greatest treasure. Forgive us for that. And God, I thank you that your word tells me that, that you delight in giving us mercy. Oh, that's so good. Father, I pray this week that we would turn and head in the direction of just seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of your son, who he is, what he has done. I I pray that we would pursue our relationship with you, that our joy might be made full, that we might love others well. Lord, you did not have your son up there on that cross that we might remain who we are. Lord, we know we will blow it. We know we'll stumble and bumble through this life, but we know we have an advocate in your Son who is forever by our side 
making intercession for us and forgetting. God, would you help us to set that target this week, though we will blow it. May our target be, I don't want to get shot at all. I don't want to sin. I'm done with that garbage and that breaking of fellowship. We would much rather break bread with you. Lord, strengthen us in your love this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, Amen. amen. Let's worship.